Uh, maybe we're live? <laughs> I just got this pop-up. Something went wrong and we're reloading the, str the, the stream. <laughs> I don't even have chat anymore. Hold on, let me pull this back. <laughs> we're trying to reload the page. Is anyone, before I do something drastic, is anyone seeing this? Anyone in the chat? I haven't made it to my, uh, we don't have chat. I think the chat totally borked on Restream. Okay, you're seeing this, it's working for me. Okay, uh, so I'm seeing a couple of YouTube comments. Let me see if anyone is still on Twitch. Okay, you're seeing this, it's working. Yeah, okay, seems like it's still working on Twitch. Wow, that one was funky. Um, I guess I'll full screen and not have the chat. Yeah, you can't do the chat overlay. That's the weirdest thing. Go star scream. I hear you. See ya. JMX Warrior, thank you. Someone on Twitch confirming they can still see me on Twitch. Hey, everybody. I'm uh, one, one week on the road, and I take a week off, and I come back, and it, everything is melting down. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. Uh, let me see if I can get back into the, to the traditional patter so I can cut this whole mess of rambling and I believe this means we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions, welcome to another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, a.k.a. Some Gadget Guy, the SGG of this terribly named podcast series. But the QA is the important part because we like an interactive conversation about all the tech news that's happened. It's why I like to hold my podcast on a Monday. We can, uh, we can sort of sort out our feelings over a longer period of time and follow stories as they develop, instead of just knee-jerk reacting to a couple of headlines and then forgetting that all this stuff is really going on. And the QA is especially important this week as we are, th this is the last Monday of the month. And last Monday of every month is our pajama podcast. There's a little less structure and we're gonna go where the chat leads us. And uh, I mean, wherever, whatever you wanna talk. I have a couple topics that I do, I do wanna cover. Um, uh, we, we we were on the road last week, so hopefully everybody had a lovely week. Last week, we didn't have a live stream, but I still put out a pre-recorded episode leading up to Samsung Unpacked. And it was a 90-minute examination. This is the most I've ever talked about, a single topic, 90 minutes long, uh, just sort of explaining how I came to be the Internet's most insufferable Samsung hater, hater, because I have no reason to ever criticize Samsung. I'm only doing it uh, to be a contrarian, obviously, because Samsung is perfect. And uh, so if you want just 90 minutes of bile and irrational whinging on about Samsung, that's what we put out last week. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit more than that. It's sort of looking at the, uh, the, the, the professional reasons for why I'm critical of the brand and the personal reasons why I'm critical of the brand. But I have to lean into that because anywhere I go now in Android conversations, it's always the same like, oh, I mean, he made a good point, but his tone, I'm clutching my pearls. Or uh, he's only doing it to like grift other tech uh, fans because he's just a contrarian and that's how he makes money. And like, there's no money. There's no money in criticizing Apple and Samsung. Apple and Samsung have done a really good job of making sure there's no money in ever criticizing them or holding them accountable for their numerous misdeeds. So uh, that's last week's show. Uh, you can still catch that. In fact, you know, now that we're a couple days away from Samsung Unpacked, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about, um, TK Bay, uh, my buddy TK, I'm, I'm wearing his merch right now. Um, he was actually on the ground to cover Unpacked, and if you want the actual like insight as to what Samsung is doing, then I'd recommend you catch his coverage. Or we also did a very short um, Best of Our Week podcast, uh, just sort of a limited, um, a, 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 a streamlined edition of the Best of Our Week, and uh, we were both on remote. <laughs> TK was in like one of the world's most technologically advanced societies. I was in rural New Mexico, <laughs> so it was a very different kind of dichotomy, uh, bookending sort of the tech experiences. Um, this week, I, I, the couple co topics that I, I'd like to kind of take a look at, take a, uh, take a spin through. And if, if we go get through there and we, we want to chat about this stuff, we can kind of flow through it. Um, 
<laughs> sorry, Ron Guido. The surprise was it only took 90 minutes and I abbreviated a lot. I even kind of dug into some of my personal experiences dealing with Samsung PR while I was at Pocket Now. That's a Pocket Now story. So the little bit that I touch on in terms of how Samsung PR is extremely punitive, um, there, there are longer stories there. I don't know if anyone at Pocket Now will ever choose to tell those stories. It, it will not serve them financially. So that's probably always going to be a closed book closed chapter. And Lampros, thank you for that. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely being facetious with some of my criticals uh, when it comes to sort of brand fandom, where I used to be a hardcore brand fan of Apple. Then I was a hardcore brand fan of Samsung. And now I just feel better not being a hardcore brand fan. But uh, Lampros saying that was no examination. It's called a documentary. Um, it, it is a lot. It's pretty info dense. So you know, that's pretty great. Kappa Cash, he's just doing it for the clicks because YouTube buries videos on other topics. So if you don't make everything about Samsung and Apple, you're like, OnePlus 11, after six months, is it better than a iPhone or a Galaxy? Then no one's going to watch your OnePlus video. <laughs> YouTube is like complicit in this algorithmic sorting of your content. <laughs> And Lampros, yeah, this week, home sweet home. I'm so glad to be sleeping in my own bed. I love it. Oh, Dr. Claw, I really appreciate that. Uh, I mean, coming from a note diehard, I really liked what Juan had to say. It's not just galaxy bad stuff. It's a good dive into business practices, product QA, and PR tactics. As a note diehard, someone who still refuses to call the S Ultra an S Ultra because if it has an S Pen, it's a note. Um, I'm kind of there with you. It's, it's the sadness of this is a brand that I really cared for. And I, I wear my heart on my sleeve. If I care about something, I'm putting it out there. And I kind of put my whole life into the things that I like. Um, it, it doesn't feel like I just one day flipped a switch and like, well, Samsung is now not good. Um, it took a long time to kind of come to this conclusion. And it was an erosion over time where suddenly something broke. And that's the saddest feeling is like when you're a fan of something and then it kind of tweaks. We see this with TV, we see this with music, we see this with films, and like the people that really like passionately uh, jump in and support something, and then those are the people that I feel are the most wounded when that thing takes a turn. And to me, it's Apple and Samsung took those turns individually for me, and I, uh, I just, it, it makes me sad. Oh, ghost or scream. I was expecting a longer story time. I, well, I mean, again, 90 minutes is the longest I've ever covered one topic. I can't think of anything else I've ever written, shot, recorded, produced, where I, I, I mean, obviously, the, these podcasts that I do every week will, will regularly run out to like two hours. Two hours because I have like a dozen news stories and some, some topics to talk about, Um Focusing in on one personal experience sort of video journal, uh, that, 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 was, that was a slog. That was really difficult to sit down and listen to and edit and clip and trim and find music and go and find the little video snippets and audio snippets that I wanted to include. It, it took a long time. Um, oh, Gabaletta is someone who is still holding on to his Fold 3. The Fold 5 just doesn't make me want to get the new one. Um, I mean, do we want to talk about Samsung Impact? I, I, I'll leave it up to you guys. If we do, like I said, you're going to get the Juan doesn't really cover Samsung as, you know, aggressively uh, kind of shallow examination of what I saw. But I also, I, like, I was out in rural New Mexico, so I really tried not to be on the pulse of what was happening in tech news that week. And it was just a beautiful little slice of kismet that the big tech news the week I was on the road was Samsung. So I was like, nah, I don't feel like I'm missing much. <laughs> At some point, I'll get my hands on some of this stuff and I'll try to talk about it. But I'm not, I'm not feeling like this was a particularly exciting year. It felt like the third year of iterative refreshes, now that Samsung is not using their own chips, their products are finally better. Uh, that seemed to be the main takeaway for me. Galaxy Tab S9 has some brutal competition from uh, OnePlus, Lenovo, and Google for the Pixel tablet. 
So there's a premium option. I mean, you go Galaxy Tab S9, and I still feel like that's the crown jewel Android tablet experience, and thankfully because of DeX, I mean, that's like the top tier to recommend. But there used to be this gulf in between disposable garbage and the most expensive tablets in Android land. And now I think consumers are going to be better served shopping more in the middle. A OnePlus tablet with a keyboard and a stylus is nipping at the heels and is likely a comparable performer in a lot of metrics. So you really have to go up to, do I need video out in DeX? Do I want a more laptop-y like experience? And if that's what someone wants, then Galaxy Tab. But you have to pay a lot to know that that's what you're getting. So, um, you know, we'll see. <laughs> Uh, Lampros, you should make a channel for videos on big tech corruption revealing, like the ones for Nestle and such. It is such an ugly place to live. It's so demoralizing. There is no fun in taking the time to examine the business practices of these billion and trillion dollar corporations and pointing out all their wrongdoings and having people who already agree with you sort of pat, we all pat ourselves on the back to say like, well, we know, and we're trying to change our behavior. You don't really get that message to spread, especially in this current era of algorithmically sorted social media. The people who watch that kind of content are already the people who are inclined to watch that kind of content. And if I felt like my efforts to really um, educate other people could, 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 uh, could scale, right? Like if I could make that kind of content, produce that kind of channel and really sort of share that kind of message, I think I would find some joy in being a good educator on those kinds of topics. But it is so much work and it is so much research. And the reason why I felt like I could do that with Samsung and I could probably do that with Apple was because that is those are brands that I have been personally entwined with for the better part of 20 years. Um, for Apple, even longer. I mean, I, I do not know of a world without Apple products in it, and that informs so much of my tech fandom today. Uh, Nestle is a scummy company, and I feel like there are already video diaries and video essays and documentaries about how terrible they are, and people watch them, and the people who already sort of know that Nestle is scummy are the people that give those kinds of channels a ton of traffic, and I just, I just can't see the energy or the effort in trying to create something new on YouTube right now. I don't, I, you know, like, for example, TK and I very loose. I mean, we're not trying to put a ton of production into it. We're not really trying to blow up like a new podcast, but we make an effort every week just to hang out and chat and relate. It's like our personal friend catch up time. And then we, we love to have other people come and come and watch it too. With two channels, both of whom are, I mean, TK is closing in on 200,000 subscribers. I have 160,000 subscribers. We're pointing our, 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 our subscribers to this other channel where long form video podcasts, this podcast, if you're watching it on YouTube, that's on the best of our week YouTube channel. There's no growth on that channel. There, there, there's none. Like our ability to build something from scratch, try and invest more energy and effort into it and then eventually arrive at something that we might be able to monetize and and like make nicer doesn't doesn't exist and and for both of us to to sort of be working this consistently at something even though like I said we're not putting tons of production into the podcast we want it to be a casual conversational tech chat we want it to be that kind of accessible romp that doesn't work so for me to try and start a new channel on a, a series of topics or videos that would harm my mental health for how dark the world has gotten, I just don't think I can do it. I don't think I'm the guy for that job. Let me take a little drink of water here and we can, we can kind of get into some fun stuff, though. We can really talk about some cool things. So yeah, J-Man is already saying I need to hydrate. So we, we should all listen to J-Man. Oh, right. <laughs> Go Starscream. I'm still convinced that the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 made for Galaxy is still made by Samsung's Foundries division. It is absolutely not. Um, I did spend a little time poking around a, a Galaxy Note 23. 
it performs so much better than anything Samsung has done in the last two years. And the reason why is because Samsung did not make that chip. So uh, the, the funny thing is, though, when you really put that made for Galaxy chip up against other regular 8 Gen 2s, there's almost no consistent performance advantage. It gets a bigger Geekbench score. I'm sure it gets a bigger, excuse me, it gets a bigger N22 score. And then the second you give it a real task, you're back in Samsung land. That is heavily managed performance. Um, we don't have the same kind of exact throttling like, uh, like we saw during the game optimization service days from the Galaxy S10 through the S22. It's nothing as, as clamped down as that, but there is no high performance mode. You can't force the chip to run at max. So we know the phone is is throttling stuff and is managing the performance of those devices in, a, in somewhat of a OnePlus kind of way, and there's no way around it. So if you give one of the most brutally complete productivity options on the market today, if you give it a heavy lifting task, it's probably not gonna perform better than like a mid-ranger mid iQoo. Like the iQ 11 beats it in a number of tasks. The OnePlus 11 beats it in a number of tasks. The, the Pixel <laughs> Tensor 2 can still beat it in things like video rendering, especially uh, uh, rendering video in 4K. So all of this marketing and branding is another problem that we have with Samsung. They have sold you on this idea that there's something special about it. And I bet you it is a better binned chip than the rest of the 8 Gen 2s out there. But then you put a whole bunch of custom software on it. You put one UI on it, which isn't a drag like TouchWiz, but it's still bringing down the performance of the phone. And then Samsung manages the performance of that chip for you with no option to just turn it up to the max. So why would you buy that? I've got a V8 in my car, but it's software managed to make sure I always follow the speed limit. Like, would you care? Why not just get a four-cylinder and get the better fuel economy, right? So um, that, that to me is, is the bummer. It, it, the the made-for-galaxy isn't the important part. The important part is Samsung is using a chip made by one of their top competitors in the foundry space, and wouldn't you know it, it makes the performance of their phones much better. <laughs> much, much better. I, I, I've been popping my SIM card out, and, and over for the first half of this year, especially for North American carriers, my top two phones for my SIM card, it's been bouncing back and forth between my Moto Edge 2022 and my Pixel 7 Pro. Um, one has the 8 Gen 1, runs really hot. The other is a Tensor 2, and with a Samsung radio, it can run really hot. So for this road trip, and just knowing that we might be getting some OnePlus news, hopefully some fun news at the end of this month, um, I put my SIM card back in the OnePlus 11. Wow, is this a better phone for that radio management, 5G radio connectivity, battery life. It doesn't just randomly make my pocket hot. And I'm out in, okay, we're, dri we're driving through the Southwest. And I love this road trip. This is one of my favorite drives. And now we kind of break it up over two days. But we go through like rural Arizona. We go through rural New Mexico. It's, I love playing music and seeing the desert scenery just fly by me. I've turned into such a dad. Um... But I have my, my personal SIM card in the OnePlus 11, and I have an eSIM. Um, I did a sponsored video for Aerolo a while back. This podcast, nothing to do with Aerolo, but I do use their service. Like, I did a sponsored video with them, and now I actually do put their eSIMs on my review devices because I can just run them for a month. Data, it's great. So I have an eSIM going on my Pixel Fold. It got to 124 degrees in needles as we were driving through. Our car could not bring the internal temperature down to what we set it to like 75. And I know the, in, the inside of our car was not at 75 degrees. You, you, but we parked, we had, to, we had to make an emergency pit stop for Lex because she didn't take into account you know, using restrooms when we were going to different places. It's 124 degrees. And as the car thermometer reads it, you walk out and it's a blast furnace. Like it is a shocking sudden temperature difference between the inside of the car, not at its max AC, but like 
what? That's 40 degree difference Fahrenheit. So I have the OnePlus 11 with me and I have the Pixel Fold. Literally just stepping outside, the OnePlus 11 feels normal. The Pixel Fold trying to use those 5G radios is noticeably warm to the touch under this uh, camera bar, under the camera housing. There's so little surface area to kind of get heat out of a foldable because one is a double screened panel. W one panel is two screens. So one, you know, like there's a screen on the outside and a screen on the inside and it's sort of sandwiched. You don't really have the same kind of heat dissipation capabilities there. So the main surface area that gets heat out from the radio and the SOC is under the camera. I'm not doing anything with it, but it is working hard out in needles and then it's hit with 120 degree ambient temperature around it. And that's not a great recipe. And the OnePlus 11 is like, Nah, this is pretty much the same. It's a champ. It's like nothing has really changed. The phone is running. I mean, it's working and it's, I know it's using some battery and the 5G signal out there is, is a placebo marker for 5G, but you know, the battery lasted longer. The, the phone didn't run crazy hot. It wasn't like heating up my pants. So it, man, when you really start looking at all these little lifestyle nuances for how this tech works, and when you go to areas where you're not guaranteed to have the best city connection for these types of devices, it really changes your perspective on what you should care about. I don't care that much about getting another generation of increasingly powerful CPU and GPU performance. I really need this industry to look at better radio management, better power management, better you know battery longevity, th those types of things. Like we could take an entire year off from high performance pocket computing and we'd still have phones that were ridiculous overkill, but we'd get better efficiency out of, the, out of, out of uh, that style. Um, sorry, that Ghost Star Scream, that was, that was a great tangent for me to go on. <laughs> From Baker Jeremy, I, I hope everyone had a great weekend. My question is, have you had any experience with using Display Link adapter that supposedly gives any Android phone that doesn't normally support video out the ability to cast via HDMI? So I do not have any of those DisplayPort adapters. I did see the ETA Prime video on it. And it seems like that's kind of cool, but it looks like it's really clumsy to set up and it looks like how you would get that working wouldn't necessarily be a good consistent... I mean, the reason why I like video output, so like Xiaomi, 13 Ultra, finally has video out through the USB-C, you plug in a cable, hook it up, and you're done. Um, the way that these DisplayPort adapters have to be sort of coaxed um, into working to me is that bridge, there's just a step too far. And uh, that, that's also like why I'm getting increasingly interested in some of these other alternatives like what Xreal is doing with the Beam. I think it's silly. Our, our pocket smartphone computers are so insanely powerful. Like this is laptop grade performance in something that fits in your pocket. It is stupid powerful for the limitations that we put on it. Um, but I'm also tired of waiting for other brands to kind of like catch up and give us some of these better features and video output and better file management and all the computery things that we still need on a good daily driver computer. Um, I kind of lost the thread of what I was going to say there, but <laughs> sorry, getting back to your point there, Baker, uh, Jeremy Baker. Um, it, it's, it's a little frustrating. It, it is techie cool that we can jump through some hoops load some extra software, connect to these different devices, screen mirror based on this sort of video feed that we're then sending out as a piece of information that is then translated into a video signal again. But it, it's so complicated that I, I look at something like the X-Reel, and we can talk about the X-Reel beam here if we want to shift, um, but like you do the mirror cast thing and that just works easier and it it's almost as good the frame rate sucks because it's mirror cast but you're like okay well that's a little bit more practical so again if you're into a phone and you really like that phone and there's nothing that you can do like if you have a one plus 11 or you have a pixel right now 
there's no video output, or like last year's premium Xiaomi devices, or even like the Xiaomi 13, I have a Xiaomi 13, it doesn't have video output, and there's nothing else that you can do, then yeah, I'd say go for it and play around with it, but it's not something that I find will be as conveniently, consistently accessible. And that's why I got so sad about the iQoo 11 and the OnePlus 11 omitting video output, because then I was like, there's just nothing. Um, we, we can't push the functionality of this and, and use it for more. Uh, tech for your needs. Would you have guests for the podcast? I, I Yeah, I definitely have some people on if they wanted to, to join, especially on the pajama podcast. I, I always feel bad like asking someone to be on for one of our normal news weeks because I don't put together my run of show until Monday morning. So that's a lot because that could be between like 5 and 12 news articles to just dump on someone. And I'm used to doing that. Like, I might just be reading up on the story for the first couple of minutes, like, right before I go live, and then I've got to form an opinion and look at this. But usually it's because I've been following these types of stories, and it's, a, it's like another new piece of information to something we've already been talking about. And then you just hit someone, you can kind of watch, like, well, yeah, I think that's bad. Well, but because of this and this, don't you think that that's actually good? Oh, right, yeah, that's probably good. <laughs> so uh, pajama podcasts are probably the better weeks. <laughs> To have guests on. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty great. <laughs> oh, Kenox. Uh, best of our week doesn't grow because we don't play Tetris. Um, my mom still has that little geek arm, and it was great. Uh, I met up with my buddy, uh, Lee. Uh, he was the, we were co-hosting that movie review show. We realized. So we did this movie review show for three years and at the end of our third year we had we had done a bunch of these pitch sessions like we pitched to agencies we pitched to studios we were talking to all of these different outlets about like we'd like to do this show legit and we think this could be a fun show to actually like put on a streaming service or put on tv or maybe we could sell it to netflix all these different production entities but we had burned ourselves out Three years, every week, no breaks. And uh, we never found... This was back before we really had the same kind of tools to like monetize or do affiliates or sponsored videos, anything like that. And uh, so we said, okay, we just got to take a break. We're at each other's throats all the time. This is getting really bitter, and it's not good for my wife and I's marriage, and it's not good for our friendship. Let's, let's go on hiatus. So we've been on a hiatus for 10 years. We missed the 10-year anniversary of going on hiatus. Sorry, rambling, um, but uh, we met up with my buddy Lee, and uh, over this last week, uh, he, uh, he was out in New Mexico too, and uh, uh, my mom was like setting up the computer, and we did have like a little mini te Tetris tournament. Sorry, that was a really long walk to get to. Played Tetris with my mom and my best friend. <laughs> Uh, oh, Lampros, yeah, I appreciate that. I get it. You seem to be up, up to your throat with work most of the times, even worse without the growth. Um, it, you start taking it personally, and you got to step away. You know, like, what is it that TK and I are doing that doesn't appease the YouTube algorithm? And after a point, you're like, you know what? Every experience I have with this platform, with the way they're increasing prices, the way they're making ads more punitive, they're not making ads better. They're not trying to serve me ads for things I would genuinely be interested in. They're serving me ads at the expense of their own advertisers to try and convince me to get YouTube premium that they just raised prices on, even though YouTube beat expectations this last fiscal quarter and made more money than they were expecting. How toxic is that? Google has every piece of information on me. that They could properly map and predict my behavior to a degree that no human psychiatrist could ever could ever profile an individual. And they purposely choose ads that annoy me. <laughs> like they're not looking. Instagram does a better job of putting static ads in my feed that I go, oh wait, is that a new type of solar panel? I might be interested in that. And YouTube is horse poop compared to Instagram in serving me ads that are relevant to my interests that would actually keep me engaged with using the platform more. 
I, I mean, like, we keep talking about, like, well, YouTube has this great algorithm. They're using it in horrifically toxic ways. With all of the behavior data they have on all of their users, we're not getting a better experience with that content. And I don't understand why advertisers who do business with Google and YouTube are okay with this. Because I'm still seeing ads, so those companies are getting charged because I'm a, a part of their cost per thousand whatever click rate, their click through. But I'm going out of my way to avoid those companies, avoid those products, and skip those ads. So they're not getting their money's worth. This strategy that YouTube has that is benefiting YouTube, where YouTube has made more money than they've ever made in the history of the company and beat expectations and beat year-over-year -year revenue is harming both their users, the end users who watch the videos, and the advertisers doing business on the platform. I don't get it. How is anyone okay with that? So anyway, TK and I are like, meh. We're still hanging out, and we're still having a good time because we're buddies and we're friends, and, and we're overdue just a good face-to-face. -face. And I think we might do a good face-to-face -face with some of these like AR glasses. He spent more time with the Rokid glasses. I've spent more time with the X Reels. And then we both played with the TCLs. And I think we're just going to try and meet up and be like, and, and have like kind of a, maybe a, a dual video. Like compare Rokids versus X Reels on his channel. And then like apps, like maybe the Nebula app versus the Rokid app on my channel. And I think that'll be a lot of fun. But we've given up trying to expect that just putting in the effort, showing up every week, doing consistent things, that there's ever going to be, like, real growth there. It's that we'd have to spend tons and tons and tons of money and really ratchet up our production and only focus on the most triggering of trending topic, keyword topics, and that's lame. That's, that's exhausting. That's not fun because we're, we're not doing <laughs> that kind of stuff. Jman150, can't believe I've already been subscribed for 13 months. Well, I appreciate you sticking around, man. No, that's really great. And, and again, I, for, for supporting the channel, for participating, I missed someone in here who did subscribe with the tier one and my Twitch chat is all borked. Um, so like if I do the chat over, no, I don't want to mess with it. I already had one major bork at the beginning of this podcast. I'm not going to try and and mess that up again. But I, I still think Restream isn't properly giving me the chat feed coming in. So apologies if I'm missing a few comments as we as we go through here. Um, Gabaletta, I'm more intrigued to compare the, oh, the Red Magic 8S Pro versus the Note 23 since both have an overclocked 8 Gen 2. Easy prediction. Um, the Note 23 is obviously gonna be better weather and water sealed. So it'll be more survivable if you dunk it underwater. Uh, the Red Magic is going to crush it, the, the Note 23. The second you add active cooling to one of these chips, it is ridiculous. You can go up another tier of performance. Like, if you look at each chip as a yearly generation, right, and you just do something like a Geekbench score, you have completely missed how exciting active cooling can be on one of these little mini chips. So if you have an 8 Gen 2 with active cooling, you can drive that chip. The, the phone doesn't run cooler. The phone runs a lot hotter. That, that's the, the weird like mental kink. So I have the, the Red Magic 7 Pro. The Red Magic 7 Pro can get to like, what was it? I think TK got his 7 up to 130 degrees Fahrenheit off the screen. Like, it's so warm, you don't want to touch the screen, and the edges of the phone are uncomfortable to hold. Um, but it performs at a tier that gives 8 Gen 2s a run for their money. If we have an 8 Gen 2, and you give it active cooling, it's probably going to be nipping at the heels of next year's 8 Gen 3. So if you really care about that kind of performance, the Note 23 ain't it, because the Note 23 won't give you that top level of performance. This is super easy to predict. And we can also go into the individual apps where so many of our phones now sort of rein in performance and sort of stop you down to like 60 frames per second in a lot of games. The Red Magics 
are the only phones that I know of that kind of, oh, I, I bet you the Asus, the ROGs probably do this too. I haven't used an ROG in, in quite a while now. But they will unlock whatever sort of stops these apps from running at higher frame rates. So if you want to play Tesla versus Lovecraft or, or Dead Cells, oh man, if you're used to playing Dead Cells on something like a Nintendo Switch or, or a Steam Deck and you're kind of capped at 60 frames per second, playing Dead Cells at 100 frames per second is so nice. Precision platformer, you're jumping, you're killing, you're roguelighting all over the place. It's so nice. And for some reason, a lot of our phones, I believe the Note 23 can unlock and push um, in their game settings. If you install another good lock style app, you can kind of dig in there and, and open up some of this performance, but it is not as brutally consistent as the high frame rate settings on a Red Magic. So if it's about gaming or if it's about heavy lifting compute workloads, the second you do active cooling, it's like you get a generational bump up. The same thing happened with the Razer Edge. How many people are like, oh, it's the Razer Edge. It's basically just like a Snapdragon 888. That's too old. Well, first of all, the 888 was still a, a very high performance chip. It just ran hot because Samsung. But the Razer Edge has active cooling on it. So your consistency of performance is kind of nipping at the heels of an 8 Gen 1. If you have a phone with an 8 Gen 1, that phone will thermal throttle and drop your performance below what a Razer Edge can do with that 888 and active cooling. So, sorry, uh, Gabaletta, there, there's like that one is really easy to call. Uh, not having the, the Red Magics this year, I, I just haven't had the time. They put out a press like, hey, if you'd like to review the phone, fill out the survey. And it was on one of those days where it's like, I'm editing three videos at the same time and I've got to shoot B-roll. I'll, I'll fill out the survey, but I got to do it later. And then I completely forgot. And I think they already sent out review units and stuff. So I felt bad because I really do like Red Magic hardware. You just have to know you're never going to get an update. <laughs> you buy the phone for like what it can do in that moment. And my Red Magic 7 Pro is exactly like that. That thing is an absolute monster of a pocket compute device but it has received no <laughs> updates since that first one at launch. Um, yeah, it, it, it's really frustrating. And again, I even sent a message out to Razer PR and just said, hey, I'm really struggling with this. Every time I put out a video, YouTube seems to tank it. And the, the Razer Edge is a product that I would like to be talking about more, but I, like, I can't have it harm my channel. And I was very open about like, this is the struggle that I'm kind of dealing with and what I want to do with your products and services. And I got kind of a, a, a terse, like, that's some interesting feedback. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure to, to keep you in the loop. And you're like, ah, dang it. I don't think you guys really get it. I'm not blaming the product. I'm saying like the platforms are, are kind of harshing us, but now it's a little, now it starts getting weird when you really throw the emotion into talking to different PR agencies. It's, it gets weird. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah, Gavaletta, like Samsung not giving DeX to the Flip 5, but finally giving it video out. I, I really wonder what the performance difference is, like firing up DeX and having that sort of multiple use sort of UI arrangement and just having video output. Because even video output is already sort of a taxing situation where power is going into the battery and you're expending more energy to put out a video signal. It's it's just weird. I... I I, I'm very curious why the Flip 5 didn't didn't have DeX. It should just have DeX. Every phone should have a desktop mode. Mid-ranger phones. Oh, I don't have it on my desk right now, or at least I don't think I do. Like, I did that Poco, and the Poco is such a screamer. There's no reason why that phone, especially for the markets where that Poco um, F-Series should be sold, that could be someone's whole computer. Easily. There's so much raw compute power in that Snapdragon 7 Gen 2. Like, it's insane how powerful that phone is for the price. And to not give it the ability to do more just hurts my soul. <laughs> oh, Dr. Claw, I agree on the ads. I really am annoyed by the Timu and TikTok ads that I cannot skip before videos on their main app. It is indeed horse poop. 
This podcast is roughly PG to PG-13. Ha <laughs> Um... <laughs> awesome, awesome. Meanwhile, for me on Twitch, ads are broken and I haven't seen an ad in over a month. Good job, you. That's great. I, I maybe am still running ad blockers on a number of websites and services that I feel send toxic ads to their user base instead of giving us relevant um, advertising that would benefit us. It's more, how can we just abuse you to then try and make you pay for something? So I... I don't do that. <laughs> Mini me. Just get an iPhone. It just works. <laughs> oh, no. I did get an interesting text while I was on the road. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my aunt a call. Uh, my aunt is not a power user, but she loves digging into tech toys. I think I've mentioned her on the podcast before. She's a she's a, a middle school and high school teacher. Her, I mean, over her, her whole career. Um, and I think she really digs just kind of like having that kind of high school um, teaching experience. But, you know, during the pandemic, a woman who is not deep in the weeds, nuts and bolts, tech savvy, knew that she had to do other things to make this experience better for her students and started getting really interested in things like, well, I've got the school laptop, but I also really like my Chromebook and I want to set up something so that I can more easily organize information. And we started working with multi like uh, external little mini external displays that she could more easily move around her house, um, how to record content so that her students could have sort of lessons that they could reference and, and uh, um, rewatch, uh, just because it's difficult. Like when you're trying to teach through a webcam, it's not the same. You don't have the same engagement or interact interactions with your students. I've tried to do like voiceover workshops. You know, you think like, okay, well, this is an easy way to kind of like get everybody and 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 work. You're all just talking in the microphones like you would normally, and not being face to face is very difficult to convey the same kind of educational uh, experience. So um, I got a text from her driving back from New Mexico and she was like, hey, she's, and, and for her phone, for, for her laptops, she's dabbled with everything, MacBook, Chromebook, Windows. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter to her because so many of her services are now like cloudish. You know, like uh, uh, you, you upload to this like school repository, you download from this, school website like it doesn't really matter what you use as long as it has a functional browser and sometimes can install an app like that's all she really needs uh, but she did send me a text like hey so i just saw this commercial for a samsung that folds in half what do you think about that and it's like oh the z flip might convince my aunt to put down her iphone and go with a different phone that's that's very interesting. So we're going to have a conversation just about durability, but she's not such a hardcore heavy power user. I think the only thing that's going to mess her up is iMessage. I think she will actually care if she has green bubbles or blue bubbles in her messages. But beyond that, there's not a lot that I think would tie her to one platform. So if she gets some fun out of the novelty of a, a Z Flip, she could be, like, the right fit for showing off, like, oh, well, let me just open my phone. Hello. <laughs> <sighs> it's so good. Um, go Starscream. With the whole, you can use ad blocking on YouTube now, does that mean revanced Vance is considered? Oh, I think you mean with the whole, you can't use ad blocking on YouTube now, does that mean revanced and Vance is considered as an ad blocker? I have no idea how YouTube compartmentalizes all of those different portals to, uh, to using YouTube. Um, I still use YouTube and Firefox. I, 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 I'm not going to pay YouTube for the privilege of being able to stream the audio of a video. That is less work for YouTube servers to, to, to make the little MP3 version of a video and let me just listen to my favorite YouTubers like their podcasts. So for me, it's not even the ad blocking. It's literally me using their service in a way that's less data intensive for their servers is something that they're going to charge me for. That's not okay. Oh, I'm, I'm real not okay with that. 
So now I'm even trying to pull out what data I provide to YouTube, what telemetry and user information that they, they clock on us. And I'm like, nah, I'm just gonna unplug this. I'm using Firefox in privacy browsers in dedicated containers and often through a VPN, like, no. No, 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 I'm done. I'm done pretending that audio only playback should be a premium feature. Yeah, like if you, you want to do like the higher bit rate 1080p and 4k video and you want to make all those like paid supported tiers I think that makes perfect sense why put out 4k streaming video for free that should be a part of YouTube premium totally on board absolutely agree just like we have with any other platform like Netflix where stepping up to a much more data intensive stream is an additional cost that should be funneled down to the consumer I'm for it Let's do that. But telling me cutting the video off, which would significantly reduce their bandwidth, is something I need to pay for, is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And that, that by itself is exactly why I don't use YouTube Premium. I am not going to validate that business model. I'm not going to justify that additional cost. I know my money isn't really going to help all those creators that I watch their stuff on because I can see the video metrics from my own videos on what kind of like ad and monetary split. <laughs> so no, I'm not, I'm not playing that game with YouTube. That's super dumb. But just genuinely, I've enjoyed using it better through a browser, just like I use YouTube on my computer browser. And especially with Firefox, being able to pass stuff back and forth and kind of sync your tabs and keep up with that kind of content, this is way better. So really, I think what I need to do next is, is uh, I'm going to start catching the RSS feeds for um, my favorite authors on tech sites and my favorite video content creators. And I'm going back to an RSS feed reader. I, I, I used to use Reddit like that to kind of keep up with a feed of content that I, that I enjoyed paging through relevant topics, articles, all that kind of stuff. But now I feel like I just need to go back and make my own. Um, and there are a bunch of like FOSS free open source software feed readers. And if that's something you, you all are interested in, we can kind of do a how to use the internet like web 2.0 again. And I think we were all happier. I think we were all happier using the web like like just out of the, the, the dark days of AOL. <laughs> it's so much better now, uh, so much better then than it is now on all of these platformed, algorithmically ratcheted services. If you really care about the content that you consume, roll your own, make your own, and flesh it out with something like Mastodon. I'm still digging Mastodon. I'm almost to 600 followers on Mastodon. Every time I co-share a piece of content, I get so much more interaction on Mastodon than I do on Threads or Blue Sky. Like, it's not close. And I don't know, what do I have on Threads? So I have almost 600 followers on Mastodon and on Threads. I have 1,500 followers. And if, it's, if I get more than like two likes, it's kind of a big deal. I think the only thing, I got 16 likes on sharing a photo of Lex petting a wild horse. She had this brilliant Disney princess moment out in the hills of rural New Mexico. And a wild horse approached her and let her pet him. We were really freaking out about that. But it happened, and I have a photo of it. That got 16 likes. Whoa! That's amazing engagement. Oh my gosh. I got comments and shares on Mastodon. But I got 16 whole likes of an amazing family moment on threads. The only other thing that I got some traction on, I got a couple of replies on... I posted a photo of... I do the audio mix down for best of our week and there were some major microphone issues on my part that no one told me about until I was like in the show. TK was like, yeah, I can kind of hear you. You sound fine. And then everyone was like, Juan, you're completely inaudible. Um, so uh, I tried to like cut and like manipulate some of my uh, audio on uh, uh, the Pixel Fold. And so I got 22 likes and, and three replies on a picture of the Z, uh, not the Z Fold, the, the Pixel Fold, um, using some audio editing software. This is not, this is not social. This is not social media. This is hype beast. I'm trying to collect big numbers and points for likes and followers. 
And that's all Meta has really ever been for me. Like Instagram, oh, I've got 8,000 followers, and oh, I might get like 100 likes. Mmm, likes. Those are almost like internet currency. It's so dumb. It, it really, it's so dumb. So, um, driving through the desert in a Nissan Sentra, uh, this is maybe one of the heaviest packs I've, I've put together for, um, for a road trip. And I had the Robo Encala, so I had a Windows 11 tablet. I had the Pixel tablet. I had uh, my X-Real glasses and my Rokid glasses. I also had the X-Real Beam to power my X-Real glasses. And for phones, I did Pixel Fold, Pixel 7 Pro, OnePlus 11, and of course the Xiaomi 13 Ultra, but mostly as a camera, not as, like, I didn't have an active SIM in the Xiaomi 13 Ultra. It was really interesting trying to use the Pixel Fold as a phone and tablet out on the road. <laughs> Simon says, the Robo and Kala looks like a Supreme device. So I still have it here. I have it in the backpack. Um, if, if you want to see like kind of a practical demonstration of how great it was to use a full Windows 11 tablet, uh, that's ultimately what I had to use for best of our week. Um, I got so close to being able to use another phone or, or the, Pixel, the Pixel tablet and then something would bork. On some phones, it was the audio. On other phones, it would, it would do webcam from one side, but I couldn't see the chat. And eventually, I just got frustrated and fired it up on a Windows 11 machine where I could put it, connect a wireless mic, pair with wireless Bluetooth earbuds. I could move around. I wasn't tethered to a tablet. It was so much easier. And of course, once I figured out that my mic game was too low, um, I think it also sounded better too. Um, going with a full PC, you know, Windows on ARM, but Windows 11, a full computer thing, so much easier for these web services like Restream and StreamYard and all this other stuff where you try and go through a mobile browser and it, something always manages to not work quite right. So I'm glad I had the Robo and Kala with me. It got a lot of activity, but it really was trying to go back and forth. Like, this is basically a Surface Pro 9 competitor. What if I tried to use the Pixel tablet to replace something like this? And the challenges are really interesting. Um, so first off, I, I do want to focus first on the Pixel Fold. Because this phone, I don't have a case for it yet. I'm still kind of shopping around what I think I might want in a case. And I really love how little this is. And I don't want it to get super bulky. Um, I, I would go out with my Surface Duos, caseless. I didn't even put on that really janky bumper guard that Microsoft included with the, the Duo 1. Because I didn't like adding that extra bulk. But these things are so fragile. They are terrifying to use without some kind of bumper or guard or protection on them. I, we're driving through Arizona and New Mexico. This is dusty, sandy, rocky climate. And every single time you open this thing up and you do something on it, you're, you're like, before I close it, let me like look around and double check and make sure I don't have like a little piece of grit or a little piece of sand or something in, in the screen assembly so that when I close it again, I don't accidentally like puncture the display. It is so much more consideration for the just sort of daily lifestyle use than oh, I pull a phone out of my pocket and I do some stuff and I put the phone back in my pocket. I know people said, you're like, oh yeah, I've had my Z Fold, you know, Z Fold 3s are still doing, doing fine. Like I, 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 you, I don't think people really fully appreciate how the hinge on this changes their behavior because I have so many different devices in front of me when I reach for one thing and I just take for granted how I use that thing and then I pick up the fold and I am thinking about how I handle this differently 
than even another something like the Duo, which has glass panels instead of a bendy folding plastic screen. Hey, everyone. Uh, everyone's already beaten me to it. Uh, Jeff El Jefe Reviews. Uh, he's in the chat right now. Jeff, I don't know if you had a chance, but I've also been spending some time with these uh, new Bear Dynamics. So uh, we'll get to this in just a little bit, too, because I, I, I'm really excited that these are new Bluetooth earbuds from Bear Dynamic, and they're not true wireless. It's, it's a neck band, if I can get it out of the case. It's a, it's a new pretty neck band from a company that I really respect and enjoy their audio performance and audio quality and topics and stuff. So, uh, so yeah, glad, glad to see you in the chat, Jeff. Hope you're doing well. So, um, from Dr. Claw, I too have taken to using mobile browsers Fennec, which is based on Firefox from F-Droid, just because of the poo-poo that is hoisted upon us by annoying ad use meant to coerce people into paying rent for an app. Also, I just, like, to me, even outside of the ads, it's just a browser is better. <laughs> so many of these apps shouldn't be apps. They're, they're, it's a service that you should interact with through a browser. Um, Simon says, Hypno, the fragility of the duo made me sell it. I was paranoid about dropping it. Brilliant engineering though. And everything that I would say is a concern on the duo is also a concern on the Pixel Fold plus moving to a plastic screen. I, it really wigs me out. Also, I kind of feel the, I, I mentioned this in, cause we, we, two weeks ago on the podcast, I, I talked about using the Pixel Fold and I cut that into a little mini uh, 48 hours first impressions video. You can catch that on, on my YouTubes. But the rounded curves, the, the rounded sides, I feel make this a little bit more difficult to open than the flatter beveled edges on the Duo. So you're out and about and you're just using it like a regular phone. Most of the time I'm just using this like a regular phone and then I think, oh, there is that thin thing I wanna do. I think about opening it because if my thumbs aren't like where they need to be perfectly on this sort of rounded side, it's harder to open than a Duo and it means I'm more likely to drop it like I did the Duo <laughs> two weeks ago. I flung that thing here on my desk. Um, uh, Ghost Starscream, are you planning on keeping it or returning it to Google? So, I am very fortunate that, and this is the the big disclaimer. I should have put this disclaimer up before we started talking about the Pixel Fold. Uh, this coverage of the Pixel Tablet and the Pixel Fold is brought to you in part thanks to the folks at Team Pixel, as these are gifts from Google. That's my FTC uh, required declaration of having received these products to share my experiences and using them, um, but there has been zero communication or influence from Google or from any PR firm working with Google as to how I structure my content or my review process. FTC should be happy now. So I'm gonna be holding on to these. It has been very interesting handing the Pixel Fold to other people. Like I handed it to my buddy Lee and he's like, oh, this is kind of cool. Yeah, I can, oh yeah, that would make me really nervous how there's like a, a plastic sheet in there. And then I said, oh, it's gonna be about $2,000. He goes, <laughs> and he kind of just hands it back to me. Um, my mom was actually, I think the most interested out of all of the people that I handed it to because she still uses an old iPad. Like the battery doesn't really hold a charge anymore iPad. And that's what she likes to play games like Plants vs. Zombies. She's still kind of grinding away on Plants vs. Zombies. I'm trying to get her into Bloons. I think Bloons is a better tower defense game than Plants vs. Zombies. Um, but I'm really trying to get her into Vampire Survivors because I think the strategy of Vampire Survivors would absolutely light her up. So it's kind of the way her brain works in putting these pieces together. And just like Plants vs. Zombies, she liked to go deep. Different weapon combinations can do this for the for these types of paths. I think Vampire Survivors would be right up her alley. Um, but she still uses an iPad for that. But she uses Android for her phone. Her her daily driver phone is a OnePlus Six T. So uh, she she like opened this up, and I think she immediately got that switch, where it's a little chunky for the phone. I don't really love that phone, but then I would never really need the iPad 
to do that other stuff with it. So out of everybody, she kind of appreciated that, like, this is the price of a Pixel 7 Pro and a Pixel tablet, and it's $300 more expensive than both of those combined, but then I'd never have to carry two separate things. And that, I think she was the one who was the most receptive. I handed it to Marie, and Marie was like, oh yeah, this is kind of cool, and oh yeah, I like that, and oh, it's kind of like the Duo that you let me use, but there's no like gap in the middle. Well, that's cool. And then I said, oh, and it's gonna be about $2,000. And she did almost the same thing Lee did. Like, this would last a week in my purse and I'd destroy it. Um, so it, it, it's, it's tricky. I am, just like the duos, I am very, very positive on what the Pixel Fold represents. But my positivity extends to a very narrow band consumer. Like, it gets an, ex an incredibly positive review for a tiny chunk of the population that I think will really be a good fit for a folding tablet that kind of turns into a phone. And that's the trickiest thing to kind of get across. Like, I'm excited about seeing this engineering. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in seeing where this stuff can go, and I'm hoping to see it continue to evolve. But the practicality of pull phone out of pocket, do stuff on it, put phone back in pocket is it, it, that comes with an implied durability that foldables do not have. And so it's like we have to go all the way back and start from scratch and say like, this is what the literal physical engineering of the, of the product means for encountering it and interacting with it on a daily basis. And how I get done with my day, I kick my shoes off, I look at something on my phone and I can just kind of chuck it onto the couch and like, I'm, I'm very casual with this because I'm so familiar with what it can tolerate. And we have no pixel, no foldable familiarity with that kind of daily lifestyle abuse. I was in a, a sort of a starter session with some of the folks at, on, on Team Pixel. And I think I was kind of annoying them, but I had to ask like, well, what was, does Google have an official response to some of the criticisms of things like how the screen protector is applied? And I got this like, oh no, we don't, I mean, we don't think there's a problem. I don't know. I can't really quote them directly, but I can tell you about the interaction. Excuse me. Because I don't think they realize that when someone like me asks, it's because we don't, we don't know. I don't know what the sort of implied limits of this phone might be. And you're not gonna test those limits in a gadget destruction porn video where the whole point is just to try and break it. If you try to break a gadget, you will succeed. <laughs> At some point, you're gonna break that gadget. But I don't know how far to try and take this. I'm like, I'm in this room with a whole bunch of other people that have been playing with the Pixel Fold for a little while and some Google reps. And I'll say something like, well, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Like, you know, obviously I wouldn't go and take this down to the beach. And you get people like kind of nodding along, but it's like, I also have rocky, hilly terrain around my neighborhood. Do I show video of me taking this out and taking photos on some of these technical hikes? Because I don't think this is the type of device you take out on a technical hike with any kind of like rock climbing, right? So already now I'm, I'm, further compartmentalizing who am I talking to when I show off the Pixel Fold. And it's really easy to like, I'll just get a photo of using this out at a cafe. And I'm like, okay, totally get that. But does owning this $2,000 phone mean I also need to have a weekender phone? Is that the recommendation that I'm making? Because I don't know. I really don't know. And then again, I'm driving through needles and my OnePlus 11 is running like a champ. It, like I'm so impressed with how that phone handled incredible heat and my pixel is so much more geeky functional in being this mini tablet. I don't think was surviving as well <laughs> as my one plus 11 was. So I, uh, I, I want, I usually don't like this. I usually don't want the company to tell me what to think. But I, I feel like foldables, and Samsung's included in this, and Vivo, and Honor, and Xiaomi, and Huawei. Two weeks ago, I showed you the Honor foldable 
website where they showed the Honor Foldable in its flex mode. I hate that there's a brand name for flex mode because now Samsung Knights all act like, you gotta have a flex mode, which basically means it's just propped up. One panel's propped up and you can use the camera. I hate brand names on basic features that things should have. But the Honor, Honor website is showing the Honor Foldable propped up at the beach with a surfer running by. And you're like, I would never take a foldable down to the beach. But the fact that you put it on your website means you're making an implied recommendation. You're, 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 you're telling your audience that this is something that the foldable should be able to do. And I don't feel we've gotten that kind of guidance from Google. I'm really concerned as to like how, how far in my own product testing should I take the Pixel Fold? Because at some point it will fail. At some point it will get pushed too far and I'll probably end up with a broken device. But I don't wanna just jump to breaking it because I don't feel you learn anything about what you can really do with it until we know what confidence does Google have in the limits of this device? And when I'm in those sessions and I'm trying to talk to, you know, Google product reps and Google engineers, I think they just act like, oh, this guy's just trying to like nitpick it or tear it apart. And you're like, no, I want to show this thing out in the real world. I want to show what you can do with it. I want to take it places and do things with it. And I don't know how far to go. And it's going to take me a really long time with these little baby steps. But if Google makes a claim, then I can investigate the claim and say, hey, you know what? They showed this video of using it out at a park. That worked great. They showed this video of taking it down to the beach. I think that's a terrible idea. <laughs> I can't get there. So it, my Pixel Fold coverage is gonna be really slow and iterative just because I'm not comfortable pushing it as far as I took the Duos. I was on the Duo 2, I had already had experience with the Duo 1. It has glass panels for the screens. I understood that form factor so well and within days, I was already taking it out to do like photography out in sandy and dusty areas. Makes sense to me. And, and I think the Duo 2 handled that really, really well, especially for me not wanting to put a case on it. Um, I can't do that. I can't take my experience with the Duos and just port that over to the Pixel Fold. It's so fundamentally different in its internal construction that I need to start from scratch and work my way up to what am I comfortable doing on this thing? Because I'm still even nervous to play games on it. Like, if I'm really digging my thumbs into a twin-stick shooter... Plastic? I don't know. I don't think it's for that. But editing audio on it was awesome. Having, like, the extra vertical height, because it's a square, boxier screen, that was pretty rad. I really enjoyed Let me see if I can still... I think I still have the project up. I'll fire it up here in audio evolution. Now, what would be great is if I could just screen mirror this and I could just have this up on the podcast. But I can't do that on a Pixel. No, Pixels can't do that. Uh, load project. Podcast finished. Or are you not? Are you? Are now? Now you're gonna you're gonna mess this up on me. Hold on, let me see. Podcast test. No, that's that's actually my my benchmark. I'm going to see. Ah, here we go. So being able to like full screen a piece of audio as you're like zooming in and moving around and stuff like this without that gap. So this is something that I couldn't do as easily on the duos because there's a gap right by where your play head is, where, where the little marker is for kind of moving and uh, how, how you edit. You're always working around an actual missing gap of pixels. That chilled this kind of use on the duos. So this, this is great. And if you've been using something like a Z Fold, I'm not blowing anyone's mind here. Something like this, to totally, totally, totally. But, um, you know, that was really, really nice. But I'm not using the screen to edit audio, right? I'm kind of sliding around, dropping a little marker, doing a couple of little cuts, normalizing, doing all that kind of audio sweetening. That is very low screen use. <laughs> it's not a very aggressive kind of use on that plastic screen. So that, that was great. I really thought that was brilliant. I'm gonna take another drink of water here.
Dr. Claw, I completely agree. One thing I wish the main pixels would do is move the fingerprint sensor back to the power button. It's a little fidgety on the pixel fold. So when you're just using it as a phone, um, this works great. Um, that's, that's awesome. For some reason, when I open it and I do the same thing, like I turn the screen on, I can't show you guys this, this is weird. And I kind of like, you, you, you lay your thumb on it because you think like, oh, that'll unlock it because so many power button fingerprint sensors are like there, but then you touch it and you kind of like have to touch and hold. And it just feels a little different than some of the other power button fingerprint sensors that I've used in the past. Totally a nitpick just based on the familiarity of, of like, especially the Xiaomi power button fingerprint sensors that I've loved. Those things have been brilliant. And this one is just that little bit longer or futzier and I want it to like turn on and react in different ways, but it's, it's not, it's doing what it's designed to do. It's just designed to do that in a way that's a little bit different than some of the other things that I've liked in that space too. Um, I'm way behind on this chat. Hold on, let me see if I can catch some of these up. Um, uh, Surface Duo and Duo 2 really caught my eyes, but I was worried about updates and support with a Pixel that that much is at least given, but there are trade-offs. Microsoft support has been phenomenal, and I do not care that my Duos are on Android 12L, because they still do things that Android 13 on Pixels can't do, and their gesture support is better. So when you swipe and move things around, because of the panel design on the Duo, it feels like you're using split screen on Windows. It feels like a Surface. So again, it, it, you, we've been getting security updates and bug fixes and patches and all that. It's just, it's not an Android phone. So Android 13 on like the Pixel tablet, so great. The, Android is finally figuring out larger surface area displays. I think Microsoft makes a better tablet. I think they, they've been making better tablets for a long time now and the Surface is a better multitasking setup. So it doesn't matter to me that it doesn't have Android 13. It's a better multitasking setup on 12L than what we currently have with Pixels on Android 13. <laughs> oh dang, Juan has sold out Shield Hard and is now rolling in the Benjamins. I wish. How, how do I find this like magical sellout thing that people keep accusing me of? Because it'd be real nice not having to work so hard to pay all the bills. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Lyndon, th this is this is what's kind of tricky. Uh, I saw a video from Easy Computer Solutions showing the screen on the Pixel Fold being dimmer than the 600 nit LG V60, 1200 nits my Arse LOL. Um, whenever you see maximum screen brightness, because remember, like I have the Xiaomi 13 Ultra. The Xiaomi 13 Ultra, I think, is still boasting the highest brightness of any screen that's ever been put into a phone ever. Um, you always have to take the marketing with that huge rock of salt that in ultra bright screen mode is only going to be used in a very specific direct light situation to the point where it is incredibly difficult to test how these brightness modes kick on. Long time ago, I used to test by holding a flashlight right up to the top like third of a phone screen to try and trick it into thinking it was getting direct sun. And that doesn't work consistently anymore. So I don't know if there's even some kind of like, hey, if you're under this quality of light, that's probably a lamp, so we don't need to do the whole ma you know, max screen brightness thing. And as a user, if you set your brightness manually, you will never get the peak output that the phone can provide in the auto mode. But that peak brightness has never been designed to be used as a consistent backlight setting. It has only ever been a temporary burst of brightness because you're cooking your screen, you're nuking your battery. This is like, and, and you're likely using it in direct sunlight, so maybe it's warmer, the radios are cranking. As soon as you do max brightness, you're, this is like the hardest your phone can work in that moment. So it's only really supposed to be a temporary boost 
you can see what you're doing, you can kind of interact with it, and you put the phone away. It is not meant to be a sustained use case for, for using that device. I don't know of many phones that really will sustain that peak output for long periods of time. And I think it's really disingenuous of a number of reviewers out there. It's like, oh, geez, Pixel Fold. I took it out in the summer heat, and I, I, I set it to auto brightness, and it only did auto brightness for like a little, for like a minute. And then the screen throttled itself, and it reduced the brightness. Because all phones do that. <laughs> like, some phones can sustain it longer. Sure, we can definitely criticize, but you're trying to make it sound like Google did something unseemly. You're trying to make it sound like Google is doing something that only Google is doing and that not every phone has some kind of scale or measurement or duration for that peak output brightness. So it's disappointing, but then also comparing it against the LG V60 is not fair either because the LG V60 has a better 5G radio has a larger battery, has a much more power efficient chip. It's got a Snapdragon 865. Yeah, that's gonna be a better performer. So when you can boost the total output of that screen, and also lower resolution, it's 1080p display. It's not even doing 120 Hertz, so it's not even working that hard. Because again, doing 120 Hertz makes the device work harder. And you only have 60 Hertz on an LG V60. An LG V60 is always going to be the least fair comparison for a modern phone. It's the most feature complete device. It was sold at an incredible price when it was launched brand new. It is still one of the all time best battery performers in Android land, one of the most modular setups. It, you're always gonna lose. So if you're gonna try and compare brightness or battery life against a phone, the V60 is always the winner. <laughs> that is how much we've lost with LG not being in this game. But I'm out in Arizona sunlight in direct high mountain, just getting blasted. It's over 100 degrees. And I go to open the, the Pixel Fold and it takes that, that brief second where you can see that the, the, the light sensor is, is triggered. And then the whole internal display pops and I can see what's going on even though I'm in direct sunlight and I do the little thing that I need to do and then I close it and I get on with my day. There is no situation where I want to use a phone like this, a mini folding tablet like this in that kind of heat, in that kind of direct sun for very long. Like you're just gonna cook the device and it doesn't matter what device. I think a, a Z Fold would probably handle, it a, handle that a little more gracefully because a Z Fold 4 and a Z Fold 5 do not have chips or radios from Samsung. They have TSMC hardware in there. So those devices I think would perform better and I think that's totally fair. We can, we can rationally make that comparison. But for a techie to go, oh, I opened it. Why even bother having the high brightness potential if it only does it for a little bit is so horrifically disingenuous, disingenuously unfair. I think you're like someone who's making that kind of complaint or criticism is purposely trying to misrepresent what those features are supposed to do. And I think it misrepresents the performance of numerous products. And, and I feel like that's not a technologist anymore. That's not someone who's a futurist. That's not someone who enjoys technology. That's someone who knows that they make more money covering Samsung and Apple. And they're always going to kind of sideways Oh, yeah, I mean, like, if you like these kinds of things, like, it could be fine using a OnePlus, but, you know, it's weird when, you know, the notifications don't slide the same way. That's, that's a dumb thing to complain about. I mean, take another drink of water. Yeah, Kevin Pitts, I'm, I'm really interested to see what OnePlus might do also. Because I feel like the OnePlus will probably have a more powerful chip better radios. I'm curious to see if it'll match the battery capacity of the Pixel Fold or come out with a bigger battery, but I really feel like that needs to be a $2,000 foldable. 
if it's, it, it'll probably have better camera sensors on there too. The Pixel processing, I think I'll like better than the OnePlus processing for like point and shoot photos. But I was definitely running into the limits of the Pixel Fold. I am so used to packing phones like the Vivos and the Xiaomi's that like, I pull the Pixel Fold out of my pocket and I double tap to get that camera and I take a photo of my daughter and it looks pretty good. It doesn't look anything at all like what I would have like, like gushed over from a Vivo or anything like, uh, like the, the telephoto is pretty good. Not nearly as good as what I'm gushing over on the Sh Xiaomi. So I am definitely this year. I know everyone's saying it's the year of tablets. It's the year of foldables. But if you're a camera nerd, boy, howdy, is this the year of cameras? If you're really into composing a photograph as opposed to just taking a whatever point and shoot snapshotty image, Oppo, Vivo, Xiaomi, Sony. Oh man, is this stuff so good. And and like in those moments, the functionality of having a mini tablet in my pocket is not a draw because I'm trying to get that incredible image of my daughter doing something cool. I, I, I had the OnePlus 11, the Xiaomi 13 Ultra, and the Pixel Fold in my pocket. And let me see if I can pull up this photo. I, I, I Again, I, I want to be careful here because... Um, uh, restream is being weird. Oh, I don't think I've uploaded. I haven't shared this to the... Um, yeah, so this will take me an extra second. I'm going to show you all this photo, though. So I'm only just going to get the, the one of her. And I'm across this wide open field um, on this like rural piece of property. And, you know, I've got, I've got these three different devices in my pockets and there was absolutely one correct choice for pulling a phone out to take this photo. And I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm across an open field. So I'm, I'm far away <laughs> from the action that's happening in front of me here. Um, come on. I've got to upload it to my NAS because this is a Chinese ROM. And upload and NAS. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do this and like narrate at the same time. Sorry, I know this is terrible podcasting. And again, if you're catching the audio version of the show, this photo is amazing. You, you would love this photo. <laughs> and upload it. All right, so now... I will go in here on my computer. I'm sorry, this sucks so bad. But I'm having the like the proud papa moment of my daughter handled this better than I think any of the grown-ups did. It's this wide open field, this wide open property, and uh, these these wild horses have been roaming this property. And temp and picture. Now let me screen share. Share screen. Entire screen, screen two, share, turn it on, and it's not working. <laughs> oh, man, come on. Are you really going to bork on the last step here? Because I, I, what I might, I, I might be able to do this just going through the browser. Let me see. Share screen. Let me try sharing the window. Share that. And nothing. All right, so we're going to do this the old-fashioned way by do, going through Firefox. Firefox is always better. And drop that. Now share Firefox. And let me see if I can shrink this so you guys can actually see it. And there she is. Disney princess moment. A wild horse walks up to my daughter, and I am very far away <laughs> from her, her interacting with this wild animal. But I have the Xiaomi 13 Ultra, and I'm not wanting to, like, run up on her or, like, you know, d startle the horse in any way. This is an incredibly powerful animal that, that could react very poorly to any type of distraction like that. But I pull the Xiaomi 13 Ultra out, I hit the little 5X icon, and I snap just photo after photo after photo after photo. And this is the one that, um, like, you can see, this is definitely the telephoto from a smartphone camera. This is not like if I had had 
a 200 millimeter lens on a really nice DSLR mirrorless camera, it, 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 it's, it's a little soft when you start getting into kind of like how the detail might have pixelated. But as a total photo and something that I could probably print to a medium size, um, this is like, this was an incredible capture for that moment. And I was so glad to have a phone with a, an actual like brutally good telephoto sensor on there. So it, uh, it's like, I, again, I'm compartmentalizing because I know so many people who are going to be interested in the functionality and the flexibility of these folding tablets. But the second something like that happens, man, does it kill me that I don't have the cameras that I want to try and capture some of this stuff. Um, uh, it's not working. I'm so mad that like Restream is borking right now because I would go in, I've, I've taken a bunch of photos with the Pixel Fold and it feels a lot like I've got something that's kind of like a Pixel, a Pixel 4, right? We've been using the same sensor since the Pixel 4. It was on the Pixel 6a. This is a perfectly functional, great point and shoot style kind of camera. And when I really want to rely on taking photos of my family, I'm not looking for just, oh, well, that's like a pretty good camera. Mm. I want the best. <laughs> I want the phone that's like, I want a Sony. I want a Xiaomi. I want a Vivo. I want a phone that dedicates the development and the software and the engineering to crazy good camera. So, yeah. Okay, so what, oh, for first of all, let me let me catch up on some of these comments. Uh, from Ghost Arstream, Ghost Mode is the most stupidest thing I've ever heard of. It's probably the worst gimmick of the gimmicks that could exist, at least with the screen size this small. I really like having a prop up mode. So what's funny is on the Pixel Fold, we actually have a usable front screen. So you can do like a little tent mode, just like we would do on the duos. So like no no part of the phone See, I don't like flex mode because you put a whole screen down and now this is rubbing up on whatever surface you put it on. So if I use flex mode on like a picnic table, then this screen is going to be interacting with uh, cement <laughs> and that's going to scratch up this screen. So the thing I like is having sort of a tent mode, just like I did with the duos, um, but it is really handy. I, I use this kind of bent half mode a lot on the duos, especially as like using it as my kitchen computer. Pop up one screen, I can you know track my recipes, I can then open it up and get both screens going if I wanna stream a video while I'm looking at a recipe. That, this kind of stuff is really fun. I just think it's dumb to give it a brand name. And I think it's dumb to let Samsung name it. It's the flex mode. Cool. But basically you just propped up a screen. Like, we, we've been doing this. LG did it great on their folding cases. Where, do I still have it here in front of me? For a while there, I had my V50. In, yeah, here it is. <gasps> Whoa, flex mode. This is amazing. Now, of course, remember, reviewers did not care that you could prop up part of a screen on LGs. Oh, it's just so cumbersome having a case that's way thinner than a Galaxy Z Fold. This right here, this is the V50. The V50 in a, in a case with two screens is slimmer than the hinge of the Z Fold. And also has a higher resolution and a higher pixel pitch with both displays than what you get on a Z Fold. But again, this is, I don't know, it's kind of clumsy. I don't know who would ever want to use something like this. I'm so quirky. I like to pretend that I'm tap typing it like a little laptop. Oh, it's so, it's so weird. It's, it's not good weird, but it's like weird weird. And then the Z Fold comes out and they're like, oh, it's so oh, flex mode. It's so handy. So anyway. <laughs> Simon says, no, out of curiosity, what was the audio app? I, I've been using Audio Evolution for years. Audio Evolution was the first Android app that included its own USB audio driver. So you would get better recording latency. And I've been using it since KitKat. I think it's been around that long. So yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, Al Sabakli, completely true. Comparing any phone to the LG V60 is, is automatically unfair. The LG V60 is probably going to win. <laughs> uh, 
Linden Slate. Okay, what Easy said was that the advertised max brightness was 1200 nits and 1550 nits in auto mode. I also don't think Google is the only one doing it, but when they're advertising double the brightness and the V60 is brighter, it's a little weird in my opinion. Also, he tested in direct sun. I'd need to give it a shot, but the same thing happens. Like, so I've got the Xiaomi 13 Ultra. And part of one of the videos that I tried to shoot was examining this claim. I reached out to the folks at TCL and I haven't heard back because this new bright screen brightness technology that Xiaomi is using was co-developed with the folks at TCL. And so I reached out to them and said, hey, is there someone who could talk about this? Because I'd really like to show how it's different or what it does. We're so used to hearing Samsung and AMOLED. I want to talk about what, why you decided to do this. And they're like, yeah, 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 that'd be great. Let me get someone and we'll get back to you. And then they never got back to me. But I can take the Xiaomi 13 Ultra. I'll, I'll stand in the shade of a tree and I'll set it next to the Vivo or even like my Xiaomi 12S Ultra, which did not advertise anywhere near as bright a screen. And then I step out of the shade of the tree and I try and get the sun directly on the screen. And then it doesn't kick on the extra brightness. So then I move it back and I try it again and I try it again and I do it again and it never does it. But then like later on the day, I'll just pull the phone out of my pocket to do something and you immediately see this pop and it changes the contrast of, of the screen. It changes the brightness of the screen. If you're looking at a photo and it pops, it changes the colors that you're seeing in the screen because it's just a sudden surge of brightness, but I can't make it do that. I can't get it to do it on command. And so I don't know what these triggers really elicit. So again, I've had experiences using the Pixel Fold where the inner display pops and I see there is this sudden surge of brightness. And you're just gonna have to kind of take my word on it because I can't demonstrate it. Not like what we used to be able to do back when you know, screen brightness was like one of those things every tech reviewer would review. Like when a phone review was just a top-down camera shot with these two hands kind of manhandling the gadget, um, that was something that I used to do a lot. I'd hold a flashlight over one and hold it over another and you'd be able to see on video those differences. I can't make the phones do that anymore. Or if it does, it's like, it's like a little bit brighter, but that's not what they advertise. So I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with Easy's video. I'm just saying you take a phone out and if the Pixel Fold is working harder, it might already be thermal throttling. Because I know it's hot where he is right now. And if the radio's cranking and the, the tensor is cooking and the screen is bigger and is, is running at 120 hertz versus um, the, uh, the LG V60 running at 60 hertz, I completely believe that it's already at a tier or at a state where it's not gonna juice the brightness because it's already being used so warm. I don't know, that would be my hypothesis. Um, because I, I really do think, <laughs> from my experiences using it, and again, using it in some pretty hot climates uh, during this road trip, um, I've seen brightness from the Pixel Fold that would make me believe it can crank brighter than an LG V60 but I don't know how I would reliably test that. I don't know how to demonstrate it. So it's something that I just kind of feel like is anecdotal until we can maybe see sort of a laboratory test to say, these are the conditions that need to be met for the phone to engage in this super bright mode. So we'll see. I mean, you know, what I could do is it's re relatively cool in my office. I don't think my V60 is charged. Um, let me see if I can just at least get it booted up or let me see if I can at least find it. <laughs> and uh, we, we can try and do like a little demo on camera of just the manual brightness because these phones would both be pretty cool. And uh, we can come back to that. And then I just got to make sure I really have to do a better job of like double and triple checking all the phones and making sure they stay charged. Running, a, never run a phone museum like I am. It, it's, it's terrifying thinking about all the batteries that are, are like starting to fail on these older, older, older phones. All right, we'll, we'll let that kind of, it, it, the battery was dead. <laughs> so we'll let the V60 kind of kind of top off a little bit and we'll come back. We'll, we'll give it a practical demonstration here. And I guarantee you it is not going to be, um, 
a, re a good real world test. Like having studio lights on in front of me, I've got the AC kind of kicking on right now just to try and keep our house under 85 degrees. Um, it, I don't think it's gonna, it's gonna be a good demonstration of what the two devices do. Um, yeah, Dave Burns, uh, we're uh, two generations behind easily on foldable cameras. Um, he, he, Dave writes, but the Pixel Fold uses the A series camera system, not even the goober cameras like the, not even the gooder cameras like the, oh wait, the Z Fold uses older gen camera tech too, huh? Um, you just don't have depth. Like when, when I hold up you know, a, a, a Xiaomi and you see like there's a, a, a lump and then an additional camera lump, there are two camera lumps on, on a Xiaomi 13 Ultra. You need depth. To, to play with sensors and lenses and stuff, but you know, it's kind of a bummer. Oh, Copacash, guess where I saw that photo of Lex? On Flickr. Heck yeah, you did. Because it's a nice photograph and Flickr is a better place to share photos, especially if you wanna like kind of blow them up and see, and, like look at the details a little bit better. Anyone who's not using Flickr and says that they're into photography is probably lying to you. <laughs> Barry Johnson's back. I'm way behind on the chat, guys. Sorry. Um, oh, <laughs> Barry's replying to some of the stuff on Easy. Uh, hold on. Lyndon in chat. I and others in Easy's group chat don't have the issue with our pixels. We are on a different release, but worked with Easy to change his version to light mode, and the issue is gone. On Easy's, if he's in light mode, it pops every time. He was using dark mode when he saw the issue. So that's a, a an important piece of information right there too. I live in dark mode. I would not have assumed that the characteristics of auto brightness would change based on light mode or dark mode, but now I have yet another data point that I need to compare when I'm trying to get these things to pop. So maybe that could also be an impact on why my Xiaomi doesn't do what I think it should do when I'm standing in shade and then I move to sunlight. And maybe a Vivo handles that differently. I, it's It's... It's maddening when you really try to test this stuff and you're not just like, oh, I read a Geekbench score, so this one's gooder. It's, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> like, your brain breaks when you're trying to handle all of these different variables. And you still get to the end of this and you say, like, this isn't a complete, a good complete test of what you will encounter. But when I can control for these variables, these are the outcomes that I get, and maybe that helps you make a more informed purchasing decision. So, yeah, it's tough. McCorkerin! Uh, hey, thanks for jumping in, man. It missed the first, the first half. I'm now into one hour and 42. Um, Bionic Scoop, I know a good Flickr account. Yeah, you do. Uh-huh, so people should be definitely following Scoop on the Flickr. <laughs> uh, let me see I, I want to shift gears here real quick and talk about some nerdy audio stuff um, but I want to see if I can get my V60 at least booted can you even boot anymore Ugh. I, I was like in another conversation and I know like I, 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 we, we make fun of the V60 just for being so old but it's also like Man, nothing has has tackled the tankness of the V60. It is the last truly feature complete phone that's ever been sold. So yeah, some other phones can do things better, but like really getting into the nitty gritty of stuff, and you're like, oh, but new phones are so much more powerful. You're like, how? Demonstrate that. And it's like if you're telling me that you care about five frames per second on a game for mobile, I don't know that you're really making the compelling argument that you think you are. <laughs> I don't think you're really showing how much better these new phones have gotten when a V60 with two screens can outlast the battery life of a similarly configured single screen premium tier phone today. I, like, 
I think you've missed the plot. I think you're not really using this stuff and you're just regurgitating specs at me. But I forgot to bring the box up and I wanted to show this off here. One of my favorite pair of true wireless earbuds is from Bear Dynamic. Um, th these are the Bear Dynamic Freebirds. I'm now on my third set of ear tips because I use them so much. I, I kind of burn through foam ear tips on these things. Phenomenal battery life, really good audio quality. Um, not the best noise cancellation, but top tier. Like I would put them in, you know, like how El Jefe Reviews ranks, like this is S tier. I, I would say the Freebird are A tier, just below that S tier, but they arrive at a really good price. Years ago, I made kind of a tongue in cheek video, but I, I told my honest truth, I think the best mobile audio earbud experience is the neck band. I loved LG tones. I loved my one mores. I had the, I have them over there. They're on that shelf. The planar magnetic, the ow sound. Those things are, were so frustrating to use for like pairing and, and connecting them to different devices, but like incredible audio quality, dual driver, planar magnetic, neck band, Bluetooth audio, brilliant. I haven't had a lot of follow-up to a good neck band. There haven't been a lot of companies putting out nicer neck. I mean, you can find a whole bunch of gut rot. Like you can go to Amazon right now and type in Bluetooth earbuds neck band and find a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but like that, those really good, the one plus neck band. Those, those were really good. The one more neck bands were really good. I haven't found anything that's kind of caught up to current Bluetooth audio tech and gives me something that, you know, I can just sort of drape the, the earbuds around my neck and just leave them hanging there. I always have to carry some little puck or case or lump in my pocket. And I'm already wearing cargo shorts. I am not a fashionable man. Um, but it's nice to not always have something like this, like whacking against your kneecap, just because you have to have something to put your earbuds in, and I can just carry something like this. It's one of the reasons why I also like bone conduction, is because a bone conduction headset can just kind of go around my neck, and I don't have to have something live in my pocket. It, it is somewhere more ergonomically accessible without taking up extra space. That was a really long-winded way of recapping that video that I put out years ago, why I feel neck bands are better than true wireless. And uh, Bear Dynamic is now selling this. This is the Bluebird, uh, Bluebird ANC2. And it's got all of those little bells and whistles that we would want to see on a nice pair of Bluetooth earbuds. It's got a decent little neck band. I wish it had some, some kind of better kind of clasp so that like the little earbud drivers would like stick together so they wouldn't just be kind of flopping around. But really good, uh, really good tuning, really good audio, uh, very capable ANC. The only thing I've run into that I do not like about their ANC setup, the driver shape. So if you turn these on with ANC on before you put them in your ears, you are almost guaranteed to block the microphones and you will cause a feedback whine as you're putting them in your ears. So I, I put them in my ears and then I turn them on and everything's fine. That's so far the only thing that I can, I can list as a potential con is how you use them. Like if they're on and you put them in your ears and you've got the A and C cooking, then you'll probably hear a little <laughs> just as you're getting them in your ear canal. Other than that, I am so happy to have a nice Bluetooth neck band to recommend again. So I'm gonna be doing a, a, a more in-depth look. Um, I got them just before we hit the road. Have not had a lot of time to really do critical listening, but they, they perform a lot like the Freebird and the Freebird are excellent. Again, this is a top tier recommendation for an earbud with fantastic battery life, good features, good ANC, you know, like Bear Dynamic is a name you can trust in audio tech and audio gadgetry and stuff like that. I still have my 770s on the shelf. You can see them. They're out of focus right there. Those are my DT770s. Always have them within arm's reach. Like I, I just understand those headphones better than almost any other headphone on the planet. So... 
Bluetooth earbuds, man. I mean, sorry, a Bluetooth earbuds on a neckband. That's really exciting for me. So it's something to just kind of nerd out. Um, I, I, I love it. Oh, Jeff. Okay, I was, I was wondering if you'd had a chance to play with these yet. Because um, you usually, you know, kick my butt. Um, yeah, these are the Barodynamic Bluebird ANC 2nd Gen. So they, they, they've been out for a couple weeks now, I want to say. Um, but yeah, they're, they're the refresh. And McCorcoran, there are other neckbands out there. Um, there are some other good sporty neckband earbuds, but nothing that takes you up to that higher quality audio uh, tier. So these aren't quite going to be the replacement for the dual driver and the triple driver one mores. But those one more neckbands never quite got all of the same techie features that we now take for granted on true wireless. So if you wanted the audio quality, you had Sound and one more and one plus, and you had all these great like different options for drivers and stuff. But now, like, everyone's so excited about True Wireless, if you want all of the cool techie stuff on top of that, then you kind of look at True Wireless instead. Um, so I'm, I'm just happy. I'm happy to have an option from a reputable audio brand that is nicer. It's not, it's, they're not even as expensive as doing the, the Freebird. I think they're, like, 150 bucks, and the Freebird retailed originally for 200 um, but it's nice. I've got ANC. I've got those, that bare dynamic tuning. I can get in with the app and kind of tune and customize stuff. Um, it's, it's really nice. It's really nice to have the option. So I'll, 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 I'll try to show it off a bit more in depth when I've had some time to, to, to listen to it more. <laughs> Copa cash. I've been living in dark mode for so long. Switching to light mode might blind me. <laughs> Uh, let's see. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Hashtag no more ear infections. Let's go bone conduction. Man, I, I'm, I'm having to be so careful now too. I'm sure, I'm sure Jeff can appreciate this. Like, I cannot go earbud after earbud after earbud. I've got to take longer breaks in between earbud reviews. Cause like, even when I think I'm doing all right, so we're driving through the desert. Just the climate changing from Southern California to Arizona to New Mexico. The inside of my ear was doing something that was uncomfortable. And I, my daughter almost always manages to pick up like a sinus infection whenever we visit New Mexico. The first couple of days she's all snotty because she won't just like blow her nose because she's a little kid. Even that is enough to tank me for a week on doing other earbud reviews. Like, the biology on wearable technology is so gross. <laughs> it's so disgusting. But these are like the fundamental challenges. The more you interact with something that biologically attaches to you, we are still struggling to make this stuff work the way that it probably should. That's such a head trip to me. We've had headphones for over a century. Things that you can wear on your ears to make sound that goes directly into your ear. And we still don't really have great, broad support for all these different kinds of people who might listen to headphones. That's still a significant challenge today. And now we're going to say like, oh yeah, but you just get some AR and you can wear glasses and stuff. Like, moving something from our ears to our eyes is another fundamental seismic shift in how you have to account for different people's biology. <laughs> so, so, so difficult. Oh, so Jeff has the non-ANC version of these. So yeah, I, I again, these will not be in your S tier, and I don't think they're supposed to be, but for a good, sporty, premium audio listening setup, I think you'd dig them, Jeff. I think you'd really like them. I think you would also really get frustrated by the ANC feedback. Every now and then you get an earbud and as you're trying to twist it into your ear, you catch just like a little tweak of it. And this has been very consistent, how I hold the driver to twist it into my ear. I hear a little what? every, almost every single time. Um, yeah, McCorcoran uh, Bear Dynamic has been including multipoint, super, um, uh, super handy, just being able to at least connect two different devices. 
And Jeff is saying, flagship level neck bands are a dying breed. Absolutely sucks that they lost popularity so soon. I wonder if we'll, we'll kind of keep, you know, because everything kind of flows in like a cycle, right? So there's a cycle of True Wireless. True Wireless exploded, but companies aren't making money on True Wireless like I think they thought they would. Sales kind of plateaued last year. And so it's like, we're still selling a ton of them. Obviously, like Air, AirPods are going to sell like crazy forever. Galaxy earbuds are going to sell like crazy. Um, but we're not finding the growth. So there was this explosive growth in True Wireless. And then that's kind of leveled off. We're not finding new consumers to sell True Wireless to. Now we're just going to be satisfying the people who already own True Wireless and selling them earbuds over and over and over again. So if that's the case then getting something a little boutique-y is possible again. You know, like if an OW sound were to come out now with a bigger battery, neck band, better, uh, better power management for a planar magnetic earbud, that makes sense. Like I've got my, um, my Odyssey planar earbuds here, and you'd probably want something a little beefy to power these drivers, which is why I usually keep them connected to my FIO, my little BTR, uh, my... BTR7. Um, this combo takes a little extra juice, right? So I don't necessarily get better battery life by having this like iPod mini in my pocket all the time, but it properly drives these planers. So if I could move these drivers to a neck band, then I think I'd have a really good combo for that. So I, I think there's room for neck bands to make the return kind of like vinyl, right? Vinyl now outsells CDs in, in terms of units and in terms of revenue. So companies make more money selling vinyl than they do compact disc. I bet you we could get to a point where neckband audio products like this could be kind of that boutique-y solution. You could get, if you could get a company like Odyssey to come in and say like, hey, we're gonna make this specialty neckband that powers this and connects to that, and we're, we're gonna put it with these drivers, I think you've got room to be the king of that niche. Because there is a little, I think there is a Bluetooth neckband that supports the, uh, uh, here it is. So this is the little Bluetooth thing. And I don't want the Bluetooth to have these little like capsule batteries. I want the full neckband. And I think that would give us better power and better support, which is why I keep my, my Odyssey on the FIO, which is regular headband cables instead of using their Bluetooth audio cable. That got real deep. I didn't really mean to go that that hard on, <laughs> on different Bluetooth headphones and ear ear loops and neck bands and stuff like that. So <laughs> um, that's a good question, Lampros. I actually don't have a good solution for that. So Lampros is acting asking if we have glasses, we could do bone conduction. Uh, could they work like that, or do you connect earphones in order to have audio with the glasses? So, um, I forget which ones did have some kind of bone conduction capability. Weren't there glasses that did bone conduction pads? Actually, didn't Aftershocks do something like that? I think they had, like, bone conduction pads that rested behind your ears. I can't remember. Um, but I still wear, with any of my glasses, I usually just slap on some other earbuds or some bone conduction. And it's that awkward, like, do these sunglasses go over these headphones or under these headphones? And you kind of have to just mess with different solutions for that. But I really think bone conduction pads on a pair of glasses would work really well. Um, it, it just takes a little bit of engineering. And again, you've got to account for all of the other people that have different shaped heads. And that's, that's a challenge. If you can't make the glasses easily adjustable, then you cut out a lot of potential users because that functionality is difficult to, uh, to kind of work with. Oakley. Oakley had them for a while, but battery and hot weather performance was booty. Stinky, stinky booty. Um, yeah. So uh, I just want to kind of wrap this up because um, I can't go too, 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 too long. And I say stuff like that. And then I ended up going for like, like three hours on a podcast. But I did want to talk about X Real for just a second, because um, I have a whole video out. I, I did a sponsorship, a sponsored video with the folks at X Real. Um, you can tell I'm OG though, because my 
my glasses are still labeled Nreal. So they changed the brand name and now they're Xreal. And I think that's unfortunate considering what Elon Musk has done to Twitter that now everyone's like, oh, X, blah, blah, blah. It's like so extreme. But Xreal did this before Elon got in there and ruined Twitter even more. I just feel bad for him because it's the wrong letter right now. <laughs> So we've had problems where phones that don't have some kind of video output haven't been able to use these really awesome wearable displays that have these kind of like AR capabilities. So there's like basic head tracking built into this, three degrees of head tracking, and they're really crisp 1080p displays. So unfortunately with Apple in the market now, talking up Vision Pro, we've got to start educating consumers on things like not just resolution, but pixels per degree. So how much resolution is packed into the space in front of you and how large is that space? And they kind of get it when you say like, well, your phone has a much higher resolution per inch than your TV does. Oh yeah. And I hold my phone closer to my face and you're like, okay. So, Something like Apple Vision Pro has 4K resolution, but it has 4K resolution spread out over a significantly wider field of view. So, if the main purpose of something like Apple Vision Pro is to float a TV out in space in front of you, you don't need, you don't use all of your peripheral vision um, resolution. It's only going to be the center of your display is what's really showing the, the TV floating out in space in front of you. And if we kind of cut that down from like 120 degree field of view to like a 50 degree field of view, then these sub $400 glasses can actually put out a sharper center image than what the Apple Vision Pro can put out. You don't get any peripheral vision resolution, but it's about putting that TV out in space in front of you and seeing a clearer image of that. If you're going to use them as a second monitor for your computer, you're going to see a sharper clarity in the center of your field of view on something that costs one-tenth the price of the Apple Vision Pro. But the problem is, is trying to find all the compatibility for all these different computers. So if you plug them directly into a laptop, you just see this sort of like static image and there's no head tracking. Um, if you plug them into a phone, you have to use an app, but then the app is really limited. So you can't do like, you can't use the other apps on your phone. You can only use like the Xreal browser. So we've got to move the brain to another device. And this is a little translator. This is an augmented reality translator for the Xreal glasses, the Xreal beam, will take the video input from one device and add the head tracking to the glasses. And that's really the main crux of what this thing is, is gonna do. So if I plug in my Steam Deck, uh, if I plug my glasses directly into the Steam Deck, it's just a static image that stays in front of me no matter where I look. But if I plug my Steam Deck into the beam and then the beam powers the glasses, I can take my Steam Deck game and pin it in, a, in one specific spot, and if I look away, it stays where I pinned it, it relative to my body. So the Beam also gives us mirror cast support, so this doesn't work with the pixels. I, I was, uh, this was really clumsy in my video. I did not do a good job of doing the whole flow chart of what's compatible, but this won't work with the pixels, but like the OnePlus 11 does not have video output, but it does have mirror cast support. So now I can send my OnePlus 11 screen wirelessly to the beam and then the beam will power my glasses and I can move around and I can do all of, all of the really fun augmented reality and head tracking stuff. This thing works so well. The beam is so fluid and it also does this really beautiful, um, what do I call it? There's like a, a micro delay. So that sounds like it would be bad. This is cranking at its maximum refresh, which makes the, the animation of looking away from the window really, really smooth, but it slows down 
the reaction from you moving your head. So if you're just using the glasses by themselves and you move, it's, it's, it's keeping up with you exactly as you move your head. And this can be really jittery, especially like if you're on a bus or if you're on an airplane and there's turbulence and you see all those micro flutters of you moving around and the image kind of shaking relative to your face. So this slows down every single head movement so there's just a micro delay and it adds a video stabilization effect to what you're looking at. So you've got your floating window and you move. It's not that it's a perfect jittery head movement move. It smooths out that pan and then brings you back. So the whole combination of the X-Real glasses and the X-Real beam is sub $500. Which is pretty good. <laughs> like it, it's, it's pretty solid. And, and again, this was one of those things like I would put the pixel fold in someone's hands this, this is so crazy. You put the Pixel Fold in someone's hands and they're like, oh yeah, oh, this is so cool and it opens up and it's a tablet and this thing is $2,000. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it kind of does like what a tablet does and it kind of does what my phone already does and I understand you put them all together and that's, that's kind of interesting. I've been putting these wearable displays on people's faces and it's one of those techie things that really does feel futuristic. Already... Foldables are appreciated for being this interesting design and engineering challenge, but they already have current metaphors. People already understand using a tablet and they understand using a phone and it's a phone and tablet in one and that's kind of cool. People have so little experience putting a face computer on their face in front of their eyes and this still I mean, it's like I did the, two years ago, I did the TCLs. Last year, I started playing with the Rokid Air and then the X Reels and the N Reels. And I still put this on people's faces and it's like something they've never seen before. We have done such a terrible job of bringing in virtual reality, mixed reality, and augmented reality. So few consumers even have the language to, to describe or express what these things look like. So, like, I'll bring it back. I know I mentioned this on the podcast uh, more than a month back now. Um, we, it was the last day of school for my daughter's school, and we were just playing out at the park, and I had these and the Row Kids, and I had my Steam Deck, and kids were, like, lining up. <laughs> like, like seven-year-olds seven -year to, like, 13-year-olds, and every time some kid would come up, and be like, listen, I don't know your family, you have to get a parent over here. I can't just put something on your face and then have your parents freak out if they're not comfortable with you talking to a stranger putting glasses on your face. Um, only one parent tried it. It was a woman about my age, but I, and it wasn't so much that she was even interested in this. I was like, hey, do you want to give it a try? And she was like, yeah, I don't know. I was like, I could fire up some Tetris. And she went, I like to play Tetris. Let me see what that looks like. And so I put these on her face and she's like, she's just jamming. And she's actually doing pretty good. She actually did play Tetris. But she takes them off and she goes to talk to the other moms and she does not have the language to describe what it was like to have this floating window of computing in front of her. And it was such a crazy, I mean, because again, anyone in this chat and, and right now, any people that we hang out with in terms of tech, can kind of get a sense of this and, and talk about it and, and share some of the experience, what it's kind of like. But until you really put your eyes in front of these lenses, you, you don't really know, but you've got like a metaphor in your brain for what it could sort of be like. So many consumers out there have no ability to conceptualize this experience. They do not know what this combo would be like. And they're waiting for Apple marketing to tell them how to feel about this tech. And they're years behind what you can really do with it. it it's, it's shocking. And, and we're, we're now we're trying to attack the high end of this market when we still haven't really figured out the basics yet. Because <laughs> this right here is giving us a passable representation of what Apple Vision Pro is being marketed as. It's being marketed as a way to float an iPad screen or float a, an Apple TV television in your field of view at $3,500. And this 
is already giving us kind of the same reasonable quality. It's just not giving us as fancy a display and peripheral vision support. That's super intense. <laughs> from, from $500 to $3,500 to kind of roughly approximate a similar style of use. Now, the Apple Vision Pro is going to be way better for um, body-independent spatial computing. I hate that Apple is trying to rebrand mixed reality as spatial computing, and I hate that journalists are just going with it. But um, you have to really wonder, is it worth $3,000 for me to float a window in front of me and be able to walk around that window? I don't know that that's worth $3,000 to me. Did I say $300,000? I was way off there. It, I don't know that that's worth $3,000 to me. It might be worth it to you. I don't know. I've played with mixed reality, and it's cool. I float a window, and it stays there, and I can kind of move around it. Awesome. I don't know how often I'm going to really use looking at a window at an extreme angle. So I can't do that on the X Real Air, but that window will always stay relative to me. And that I use a lot more when I'm on the go. Because then if I look over something on my right shoulder and it's right there, and I can look over something on my left shoulder and it's right there, that's kind of cool. Um, I don't know that I need to walk away from those windows and view them at an extreme angle from far away. <laughs> that to me hasn't been as big a hook for this legit on the go mixed reality kind of use. So 500 bucks, 500 bucks. And you've got portable wearable displays that legitimately fit in a shirt pocket, or I can just kind of like throw them on a t-shirt. Oh, whoops. I don't mean to bump my mic. Let me go to the other side. Just kind of clip them to my shirt, which I know I'll never be able to do with a mixed reality headset. And then if you're worried about having the beam in your pocket, because this is a little lump. It's a little battery lump in a little mini computer, and you can carry it with you in a pocket. It's you know kind of about the size of a classic iPod, if you remember iPods. But if you're complaining about something like this having to be tethered to your glasses, but you're not complaining about the battery dongle on an Apple Vision Pro, then you're a hypocrite, right? Then you're an Apple shill. So uh, this right here has been awesome. So I'm, I'm really interested to see if other companies are going to start playing with making their own brain. Instead of waiting and hoping that smartphones will be smart enough to really use this stuff, end run. Get around the manufacturers and include better support and better products just on your own. And I think now we've got a more usable... I don't think we really need the Beam. It kills me that we have to make the Beam because so many of our other phones lack this kind of computing. But if the phones aren't gonna do it themselves, then now I've got an interface that'll work with anything I wanna connect it to. I don't have to wait for proper Miracast or app support for a Steam Deck. We'll never get that kind of app support for a Nintendo Switch or any other kind of portable gaming console. This is now gonna do all that translation and 3D tracking for us. So I, I, I've been really, I've been really impressed by it. Now, let me take another drink of water and we can kind of wrap up. If there are any other questions here, I know now we're right at two hours, so uh, we probably don't want to go too much longer, but we can, uh, can kind of close this out. So that's the gig. <laughs> Dave Burns. Um, sorry, Juan, I need to spend at least $34.99 to ignore my family. Well, that's not what Apple wants you to do. Apple wants you to take spatial photos, 3D. They want you to take 3D photos of your family that only work on their 3D glasses. But they don't want you to ignore your family. Instead of having one TV that I can sit in front of and watch a movie with my daughter and my wife and we can all snuggle together and share that experience, we just each need to have our own pair of Apple Vision Pro. So instead of one really nice $3,000 TV, I need $3,500 headsets for myself, my wife and my daughter, and then we can all share the spatial entertainment experience together. We can be there together instead of having our face not covered 
with one product, we can own three products. See, isn't that just better? It's just better, obviously, because Apple said it was. Um, Clash of the Ash. Okay, so I have not sideloaded anything yet. Have you used the Taskbar app for the X Reels? Some people were able to import the X Reel Beam before uh, the Beam really shipped out to the North America. So I, I was under an embargo. I was working with X Reel on producing this video. Um, so I, I was not able to sort of jump the line. You can sideload. It is a little mini embedded Android device. Um, but for using it with another phone, I have done second screen and taskbar. I think it's called taskbar. I think it's called taskbar and it works reasonably well. Um, my big problem is if you're on a newer phone, like especially Android 12 L or Android 13, your desktop mode is probably broken and it doesn't like you can't properly minimize close or resize windows. So it's not very useful. So, so taskbar fixes so much and second screen fixes so much uh, with how these phones operate. And it works great on the X Reels, but Android is now getting in our way with very limited support for a practical desktop mode style experience. So that, that's kind of the bummer. But um, I even used them with the, uh, like one of the things that works really well because it's on an older version of Android is the Razer Edge. So ETA Prime did a video showing off the Razer Edge and using this taskbar app to kind of flesh out a desktop mode. And uh, I, I did a similar video just talking more about productivity stuff. Combining the Razer Edge with this sort of second screen software and then using it with a wearable display was phenomenal. It worked really, really well. So yeah, that was great. Oh, an awesome possum has got to run. Thank you for dropping by. Thanks for watching. I know we're closing this out. So I think you picked the right time to do it. Um, so I was also going to talk a little bit more about using the Pixel tablet, but I think I got to save that and maybe I'll just write this up as like an editorial, but I had the Robo Encala and I had the Pixel tablet and I'm really, I understand that the Pixel tablet is being built to, to Venn diagram overlap with smart displays. But this is way too powerful a computing slate to only recommend using it as like a part-time consumption device and a part-time smart display. Like this is a tier of performance that should be cutting into Chromebook. Um, it is, the Tensor 2 is a beast of a little chip. Even if it's not quite as performant in every task as a Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 or a Dimensity 9200, this thing is still so much more capable. And, and it's why in this current generation of tablets, I still think that the best argument for a good bang for buck student machine laptop replacement slate is probably the OnePlus tablet. It, it, using this, it really bothers me that Google does not have a first party folio keyboard case for this slate because they want you to dock it to the little stand and use it as a smart display. So I've got the, the Robo Encala and the Robo Encala has this magnetic keyboard. You can just kind of rip that off and it's got its own built-in hinge just like a surface so that you can prop it up and you use it just like that. And here's the little hinge thing right there. And this is it, this is all you need to carry. Snap that together, done. This is the full computer. You can use the keyboard connected or wirelessly. The stylus is right off on the side. Tablet props itself up. You don't need to carry anything else. This is fully functional, ready to go. I was writing uh, scripts on it. I was editing my spreadsheets on it. I was filling out. I'm on vacation and I'm having to send people like uh, my invoices for videos and things like that. I never get to just take a vacation. But if I wanted to do all the same things on the Pixel tablet, I've got to pack a stand for it, and I don't have a pen for it yet, and I've got to have a Bluetooth keyboard and a Bluetooth mouse, and I don't have the same I.O., so I can't connect as many devices to it without having to also add like a, a splitter or a, a laptop hub or something like that. And it's like, in terms of mobile functionality, like 
this is so much easier. The Robo Incala is just so much easier to pack and carry, and it's done. It's a complete computing experience right here. But instead, my Pixel, I've got to add other accessories to it, and that takes up space in my bag. So in my bag, to have both of these and to kind of compare and contrast, even though I'm still writing my script in Microsoft Word, and Word works great for writing something simple like that on Android, it, it was so much extra stuff to carry. So I really hope there is some kind of good travel case that we can add to the, uh, to the Pixel tablet. But I'll have to save the full like examination of what I did and how I did it. I'll write that up. So we'll, we'll make that a blog post on some gadget guy. And let me take one last drink of water. We'll close out the show. And I really appreciate everybody dropping by, especially for a rambling pajama podcast on your summer vacation. <laughs> Oh, uh, eating spatial popcorn, cop of cash. All right, so yeah, man, this summer is going by fast. We're closing out July. We got August. I know there are already kids who are back in school. So, J-Man, remember to stay hydrated. I knew you were going to jump in, J-Man. I took a break just to drink some water, and I knew you were going to hop on that. Uh, I, I always love the reminders because it's hot out there. I mean, we're going to have a hot day today. We had all the crazy weather in Arizona and New Mexico. I brought a heat wave out to New Mexico. I felt terrible about that. But uh, there's a lot. Like, this summer is flying by. And uh, we're, we're going to be back in school in a couple of weeks. It just blows my mind that the days are long, but the years are short. So um, there's a lot of stuff coming out. Um, I have... A few more sponsored videos that were supposed to be out before I hit this road trip and they got delayed. Um, so stay tuned for something tomorrow that I think will be very interesting to talk about. And then stay tuned for the end of the week, hopefully, and I can talk about something that is very off-brand for my channel. I, I will be so excited to, to start showing off some of this stuff because there are some of these other gadgety directions that I'd love to be talking about other products. They will do garbage traffic on my channel. I hate saying this out loud because some of these are sponsored videos and I really want to do well for my sponsored uh, partners, but it's also just the reality of like, if I don't put Galaxy iPhone in every title of my video, YouTube craps all over it. Purposely keeps it from my audience. So all those people who have been supporting and sharing, if you're hitting the Patreon, if you're just, you know, like retweeting, re-blue skying, re-mastodoning, re-threading, whatever it is that we call a share on another social media platform. It's never been more appreciated just because it's been such a challenge dealing with YouTube's algorithm. Um, but this is also stuff that's like, I feel like now's the right time to revisit some of this tech. It's the right time to check out new, really new tech that consumers don't understand. And it's so much more fun when we're really you know, sort of branching this stuff out and then saying, oh, and you're unfamiliar with these glasses, but you can still bring it back to a phone and use this as the brain and this is the computer and th this for your eyes and this for your ears, and we can tie it all together. And so, uh, I, like I said, that's about as much as I can tease before I really start giving stuff away. And then I have a bunch of people who will be very unhappy with the way that we sign contracts. <laughs> so again, uh, all of the support and all of the sharing, and, and, and especially the folks who have been hitting the Patreon, patreon.com slash some gadget guy. You'll probably be getting even more of just like my production diary stuff and my behind the scenes stuff because it's, it, I'm, I'm going to be trying to push a little further out there, and I know YouTube is not going to like it. So that's the gig. Got to have fun making my channel as inhospitable to YouTube's algorithm as I possibly can. So, folks, I want you all to have a fantastic week. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in, for, for sharing, supporting all the people that have been. I, I missed, and I'm sorry, I know. I think I missed uh, Jeff. Also did another Tier 1 sub on Twitch. So I, I forgot to do my bad sound, soundboard thing to, to say thank you. But it really is appreciated, and I'm glad to have so many of these fun geeks along for the ride. Um, stay tuned. Uh, I want y'all to have an amazing week. So if you look at Google Trends, the search popularity of Samsung devices is already plummeting. I do not like Samsung. I recorded 
a 90-minute podcast that was published last week talking about how I don't like Samsung and what Samsung has done to kind of course me in the direction where I am now one of their staunchest and, and most insufferable critics. Here's what's not okay. It's not okay that the biggest YouTube channels got early access to Samsung products and they got to craft a narrative around those products before anyone else could get their hands on those devices. Even in this like unpacked experience, that's not okay. And it's not okay that the YouTube algorithm is going to push the biggest channels the hardest who all got to financially benefit from having early access to all of the new phones and tablets coming out from Samsung. The money of a Samsung review peaks weeks before people who really spent their money on this gear got to try it. That is not okay. The Google trends on search popularity for Samsung devices are currently at their highest. And all the people, all of the really diehard Samsung fans who are spending money on their, st on their stuff, their voices will not be considered by the time they really get their hands on a Z Fold 5 or a new Flip or a Galaxy Tab S9. As much as I despise the corporate practices and the consumer relations that Samsung exhibits, it's not okay that the conversation around their products is so limited to the people who get them for free and got special preferential treatment to get to talk about them before anyone else. If there's ever a push, and I, I would like to be on, on camera for saying this because at the beginning of this podcast, I talked about my relationship with Google and how I received these products from Team Pixel. I feel there needs to be a much stronger regulatory pushback on early access. I feel there needs to be a massive FTC disclaimer saying, I got this, this product weeks before it was sold to the public. And that meant I received a bigger financial benefit to my videos on YouTube than people who spent money on this product. That's the real FTC concern. It doesn't matter that Samsung didn't pay reviewers to use these products. None of these videos are sponsored. But the financial incentive is I got them before people could buy them. So... If you're into what Samsung is doing, the story hasn't started yet. The story for a Galaxy starts when real people who pre-ordered start getting them. And that's when you've got to pay attention to coverage. That's when you've really got to start watching videos. That's when it's real. That's when you get the actual impression of what these things can do. And it's really not okay. And it's really not fair that the Google trends on a Galaxy is already dropping. Like search for Z Flip over the last 30 days and you can see this like sudden rise and spike it unpacked. And you can already see today that that little spike is starting to drop. That's not okay. That's not a fair representation of what a Z Flip, an S, a Tab S9 or a Z Fold can really do. Because it hasn't really been lived with yet by someone who spent their money on it. So, <laughs> go star scream. It's the glowing rectangle speech without the glowing rectangle subreddit. Yeah, you know. <laughs> awesome Possum, this is the thing that's always gonna kill you. Uh, awesome Possum says, when I saw B-tier reviewers throwing out a teaser while the big few hands-on videos were out, I was already thinking the same. the Samsung event hype was over. And we shouldn't be looking at this stuff just for whatever the hype beast machine might value. We shouldn't be looking at this stuff as I only talked about it because it's at the peak of its popularity where I'll make the most money on putting out a video. We should be looking at this stuff as living with it and experiencing it and watching it grow and iterate and refine and change. And we can't get there if we just leave it to YouTube. So um, I appreciate uh, everybody for dropping by. I want y'all to have an amazing week. I want you to do awesome with your technology. I want you to be awesome with your technology. And even if you don't hate Samsung like I do, 
I want you to be excited to use the thing that you have for the things that it really does well. Not for what a marketing department told you was cool, not for a Geekbench score, an Antutu score. I want you to go out there and, and, and do something with this and make something with this and play something with this. And that's all that really matters. The label on your favorite brand doesn't matter. The Geekbench score doesn't matter. And absolutely, the search popularity of a major YouTube channel the week of an event does not matter. What matters is that you're having a good time. I want you to have a great time. So I'll catch you back here next week. Take care of yourself so you can continue taking care of others. I'll catch you back. I love you all.